the Advanced Tech Podcast, providing a spotlight for innovators and disruptors. For links and show notes, and to find out how to sponsor the Advanced Tech Podcast, go to advancedtechmedia.org. You can also find and sponsor us on Patreon. If you're listening to us on iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify, please take a moment to subscribe and give us a rating. You can also sponsor us using Bitcoin at advancedtechmedia.org slash sponsor. Welcome to the latest edition of the Advanced Tech Podcast. Joining me today is Hodlodot and Bitcoin Katya and guest host Caro. Welcome, everyone. Hey, guys. Hey. Hey, everyone. So, Katya, let's start with you. Could you tell our listeners um, a little bit about your background? Yeah, um, I'm generally into marketing and strategy. Like for my whole professional life, I was uh, doing that and I worked for several big companies and I'm still working full time in marketing, but also like I have kind of my own small company that provides marketing and strategy services. Just a side project of mine that I started a year ago. Yeah, currently I don't know how, how that will work because now we have a Citadel. So I'm basically <laughs> splitting my time like a little bit more to get things done for Citadel as well. And Hadlana, most people know you in the space, but could you tell us, our listeners, a little bit about your, your background? Yeah, sure. I was always uh, interested in computers from a very young age. Knut Svanholm wrote uh, an article in the latest Citadel 21 called Commodore 21, which is about his relationship with the old uh, Commodore 64, the old... Uh, old uh, 64 kilobit uh, kilobyte computer from the from the late 80s early 90s and uh, uh, yeah so I, f- I fell in love with computers very early on in my life and I started working with computers as well I had a basically a pretty short career as a developer then I found out uh, that wasn't quite what I wanted to do for a living so I started a new education and I became a teacher and I worked quite a lot of years as a primary school teacher. And then I discovered Bitcoin uh, actually pretty early on in, in that career. And uh, that just took up more and more of my time. The last year, I, the last two years, basically, I, I think I spent almost all of my time in Bitcoin related stuff. And I'm really happy to now have a, a very meaningful and cool project to work with in Citadel 21 with uh, Katya. Awesome. And then, Caro, you've been on the show before, but for listeners that haven't heard that episode, if you can go a little bit into your background and talk about the new podcast that you have. Oh, yeah, sure. I basically did a a MA in social sciences, and I actively research Bitcoin and its social organization these days. And recently, I started a new podcast. Well, basically, Fort Face started a podcast. I, I, I'm just a host of it. <laughs> it's called this Bitcoin Rehab. And it's quite cool so far. And I'm going to have more and more people coming on the show. And hopefully, more people are going to be tuning in and then getting rehabilitated finally from the fiat world to the Bitcoin world, hopefully. <laughs> and that's it, I guess. I love the title. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like rehabbing everybody. <laughs> oh, rehab. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So one of the uh, things we've mentioned uh, that's been mentioned a couple of times is Citadel 21. So I'd like to get into the origin story of Citadel 21. Yeah. What was the, the genesis that kicked that off and uh, how has that been so far? I think Genesis story must like must kind of be the same as the Genesis story of me and Katya's relationship, I think, because like we, we it's not that long time ago that we that we met for for real and uh, found out that we really like each other. And uh, shortly after that, Katya told that she had been thinking about making a scene. And both of us had uh, had experience with, uh, or like, we, we lo- both loved scenes uh, from our younger days, different types of scenes. Like I had been uh, a fan of scenes from the computer scene, like Amiga and old Commodore computers, and also football scenes. And Katya had, uh, had yeah. the, yeah, you can tell Yeah, I was too. like into maybe some political, like anarchism, music, punk, some stuff around that, zines. So I guess uh, just once we were discussing like uh, the cultures uh, we were into, like in our younger <laughs> age. And um, yeah, we were talking a lot about zines and how cool it was like to have 
some representation of that culture that is like super small but like very real and very true and we were thinking then like about bitcoin and uh, i don't actually remember what was first but i remember that we talked a lot about that we want to start like some kind of project and then like just the things came together that we had this like that we had this idea that we really liked uh, zines and now we have bitcoin and then we like yeah why don't we just mix those things together and that's uh, basically how we decided yeah if we want to make a project then uh, probably this is it yeah and during those early talks we it struck us how underrepresented all the cool voices in bitcoin were and uh, how much uninteresting drivel and bullshit is written in in the traditional or some of the traditional publications in this space uh, which uh, at least speaking for myself i think most of most of the articles i see in traditional crypto media is pretty uninteresting and it doesn't capture the voice i find in bitcoin twitter for example at all and all these amazing characters that we see on bitcoin twitter with all their awesome memes and opinions uh, then it struck us that hell we need to make a place where these voices can be seen and heard by more people so what was the process like setting up the very first issue and you know what was the hardest aspect of that and then what did you enjoy the most i guess we started to work like on citadel probably in january like we started to think like how are we going to do it and i think the hardest part was like basically probably to fight with ourselves and to be less lazy because we had this like great idea but then we basically couldn't start to actually work on the first uh, issue until april yeah and so it took us really a long time to set up like all the initial things like to find out the name and um yeah, we like, spent a lot of time yeah. just on stuff like color scheme and uh, yeah. logo, name, yeah. Uh, yeah, basically all kinds of details. But I think that was time well spent because the idea kind of matured in our heads. And uh, so when we like finally set the date for, okay, we're going to release the first volume on 21st of April, then, hmm. then we had a lot of stuff ready. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just uh, working on the first issue, I guess the hardest but actually it was like, it appeared to be not the hardest, but like in my head before we started, like I was worried, like, what if like no one would like to contribute? Like, what are we going to do? But at the same time, we were fine with like, if that will be just project for like 20 people or maybe for 10 people who are like uh, hanging around and having this zine and read each other's articles, that uh, would be cool. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so wonderful to work without having to rely on business models or monetization or anything like that. It's just inner motivation and seeing what comes out of it. And that's totally what you're doing now too, Caro. And uh, I know that's exactly what Coin Acres is doing with his podcast. And a lot of content and signal is being created in, in this space just from that inner motivation. I, th- I guess that's the case with you too, Alexandra. And uh, in my opinion, most of the... That does something with the content. It can be 100% honest and real when it's not. Uh, it doesn't have any ulterior motives or incentives. Yeah, and I think it's just that we go with the flow, basically, with each volume. So I can't even say that something was like really hard because with all the help that people are willing to give, like to make uh, Citadel alive. It really becomes so easy. Like, for example, with Bitco, like he proposed to create the first cover. And I think that really helped us because like so many people want to contribute that we have to, you know, like spend less of the mental energy on thinking about like, what are we going to do with the cover? And like, will there be anyone to contribute? Because like, this comes pretty, like, I would say very organic to us. And uh, we are very thankful for everyone who contributed so far. And you've just published volume four. Each volume has been quite different. Uh, It has a similar theme, but it seems like there's a sub theme within each. And uh, I've really appreciated the, I guess, diversity of voices that have contributed. (laughs) Yeah, it's super, super varied and diverse. And yeah, I don't know about sub theme, to be honest. Maybe it is, but that's that's completely by chance uh, if it is other than 
a couple of times there has been like uh, the cover has had uh, an article inside where like when cypherpunk now martin fisher made that awesome cover of uh, all the personalities on bitcoin twitter uh, like the people inhabiting the citadel he also made an article inside of how he created that and uh, now in this latest volume and uh, rear made the, the cover he also made an article about uh, about his piece inside but, um, maybe maybe there is also some kind of other theme that we're not even aware of that just uh, just because the space moves so fast or something i don't know i like the idea of a an emerging sub theme it's almost like a exactly. subconscious process yeah, i mean we, we must all be part of something like that right uh, bitcoin moves just as fast as everything else right now so so would you like to talk about some of the, um, you know, a little bit more about the magazine itself or the zine itself, or <laughs> or should we leave it there? And I can cut this part out too. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's important that we stress how thankful we are to everyone who has contributed and all, all the positive feedback mm -hmm. and support we've gotten. <clears throat> I think we would have kept doing this no matter what, but uh, it feels really good to, to feel that the stuff we are doing resonates with some people. A lot of people have spent a lot of time contributing and big shout out to everyone uh, that has uh, contributed to us, including including you too. <laughs> <laughs> I think Carl, you put in, or Caro, sorry, I keep mispronouncing your name. Um, <laughs> so Caro, you, <laughs> right? <laughs> you contributed to the... <laughs> You contributed to the very first uh, edition and then this latest edition as well. Did you want to talk a little bit about your two articles? Yeah, sure. I mean, I remember when, when Huddlenock kind of approached me uh, first time asking me would I want to like write for his new magazine and like they're running something new. He was quite like interested in it because I felt like it was some, some sort of a cultural thing that was kind of missing from the space because, you know, just as how he said, like there's too many filters being applied on Bitcoiners and not many voices are coming through that I would want to listen to. And they're like, they kind of like filtering out all the important stuff that could be important, but they're not making it important because they're controlling the narrative. So this is like kind of like releasing this lock off from the whole thing. It's quite interesting, exciting also. But yeah, like my first uh, paper was about trust and reputation. And I kind of like went more into reputation there, like how people kind of build that up in the space and how they use that in order to advance forward. And this is what kind of I, I try to like emphasize on it, to explain everybody like it's really important that who you are, what you do, because in the end, it's it's all going to come down to you, who you, who you become in the future and then what kind of relationships you're going to build. And then the second one right now was kind of because of uh, all these, these dramas going around in the space about uh, site taking over software and services that keep uh, building up on Bitcoin. And I kind of felt like I just had to speak about it because I felt like people were being roll called basically into war. And I just, I just can't stand this. I, I love uh, all these service providers. Okay, I'm just going to fucking name them. Uh, Wasabi and Samurai. They both fucking amazing in my opinion. They both try to fight against um, the overreach of power of governments and, and all these uh, institutions like chain analysis that are trying to like really make it hard for uh, people to, to use Bitcoin in a completely clean way, as in far away from government. But yeah, they are like having this feud now and it's like they can't step away from it. And, but I would love to see them like somehow make up and come together and make a much better product and like kind of that basically that's all yeah i have to i have to you make me think of something carol is you talk about the filters being applied that reminds me i just thought that was really interesting yesterday there was this guy who uh, had an opinion on citadel 21 uh, i have his tweet here he said uh, i read a few articles on citadel 21 am i the only one that thinks they're cultish if I didn't know some contributors, I'd be really scared about this thing called Bitcoin. I guess it's a free world and anyone can write about any topic. But sometimes it's better to have some high standard filters, like in Bitcoin Magazine or Coindesk. Professional editorial and filters highly reduce noise to signal ratio. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just, it's just funny to me that he has this view on it, because that's exactly what we are trying to do to avoid having those professional editorial filters applied by Coindesk 
we want to we want to bring the actual the actual <laughs> voices of the community not uh, yeah. so uh, <laughs> Mine is the shit coin. <laughs> so I was face palming quite hard when I read those comments, uh, and he also like ended it with uh, in my eyes uh, articles of Alyssa Hurtig brought me more value than the whole Citadel Twenty One release. So yeah, uh, happy for him that he enjoys CoinDesk, and uh, I, I think his time is better spent uh, reading that. And but that's not what we are trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I know him. Uh, we actually live in the same city, yeah. and like he's a he's a decent guy. Uh, sure. But it just, <laughs> you know, what's interesting is I think it really highlights. You know, we can all be Bitcoiners, but we'll still have differing opinions. And you know, that's his opinion. He has every right to it. Uh, some people do want that more kind of like professional sort of filtered view, but I really think that that's what's wrong with the world is everything is too filtered and we need more authentic voices. So I really appreciate that, you know, you've got a very strong vision and identity with Citadel 21 and uh, I hope you continue to push the envelope and push the limits with it. Yeah, hundred percent. We will. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was pretty surprised to see that. <laughs> um, I think, what was it? Um, who was it that made the comment about Golf Magazine? That was like such a perfect... <laughs> I think it's, Yeah, that was such an amazing comment. I think it was Fartface, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so what are you looking most forward to for future editions? I guess we're looking for physical copies. That's like the big question right now and like the big part of our focus. So um, currently we are evaluating like the different scenarios and uh, I would say we are almost on the finish line about how we are going to make them, like regarding the shipping, handling, printing and stuff like that. Yeah, hopefully the volume five probably could... Um, it could potentially be the first one yeah, being printed. Yeah, could potentially be. But, or uh, yeah, could I also guess... potentially not be the first one. <laughs> yeah, so I guess if not the fifth, then the sixth, uh, yeah. the volume six. Yeah, that, that's our deadline. Yeah, that's uh, our deadline. But also as editor, uh, I, I have a lot of stuff already like how that has come in that I'm really looking forward to put in there from really cool people in Bitcoin that has written awesome stuff that's coming in the next volume. and. We also have some some great artists that will contribute with the covers. I don't like if people want to get curated news, why don't they just go on to Bloomberg's <laughs> crypto desk, like get their own news from there. Like you can get Bloomberg news there 24 seven, even watch all the noise and things on the on the <laughs> Bloomberg pro version for I don't know how many hundred thousand dollars every month and then what they pay for that. And then, you know, you know, when they see Bitcoin moving up $100, they're going to add, oh, this happened or that happened. Then they try to associate all, all these kind of noises <laughs> to things. It was quite exciting also reading this from Talib's book. What I was like thinking, like, whenever I look back at these news happening, I saw that like when something happened, they always tried to associate with something, but so hard that it had to be something. It cannot be just a random millionaire guy buying Bitcoin. It has to be some major event or some exchange getting hacked or something different. It always have to be some association with news. And then, you know, just to filter it out because it cannot be just a raw event that it was completely organic or something. It's just, it just nuts. This is like, you know, Bloomberg of crypto or, or, or the Bitcoin space. Like what I would say. It's no culture, no nothing. It's it's not like Citadel 21 where you can actually receive the true aspects of, uh, of Bitcoin culture where you can see stuff like people coming in with art and all those raw materials that really interest, interesting for people. Yeah, I guess maybe also the thing is that not everyone is actually familiar like with the zine phenomenon because like uh, zine is always right about the culture like about like actually about like subcultural things and uh yeah i guess uh, just probably people that get used to read uh, curated publications they probably haven't read any zine before i would say that's my guess yeah they only subscribe to the paid version of bloomberg probably, <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh. So what are the, I guess, the, the guiding principles of a zine? What makes a zine a zine versus like a publication that's, you know, quote unquote professional? 
maybe the lack of editorial policy? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like if to speak about zine in general, like what is it? Um, usually it's like some kind of uh, small hand printed and then uh, copied like in hundreds of copies small publication created by a few people that are like engaged in uh, some certain topic. I guess for us, it will be a little bit different if we go with physical copies. It will be more actually like a magazine, but we still want to make it like limited edition to keep that vibe of uh, <laughs> scarcity uh, and stuff like that. I guess for us... I think like an important part of a scene is also that it's made by someone who is actually mm. part of the community the scene is about. It's not made yeah. by... Yeah. <laughs> that's like essential to be able to to curate the signal that goes yeah. in there. So it's not that we hire writers or we hire some uh, chief editors and that's their job. Like, it's not like that at all. <laughs> so basically it's uh, made all by community contributions. Yeah, 100%. So what kind of contributions? I mean, it sounds like you're accepting a, a number of different kinds and varieties. What are some of the things you'd, you're particularly looking for or for more of? Well, that's ex I think that <laughs> it's cool that you asked that because that's <laughs> when I, I reached out to quite a few people uh, in the community asking if they would be interested in writing anything. And obviously, I think I would do exactly the same. They ask, like, what are you interested in? What's the, what's the length? it should be and like the answer is always uh, just whatever lurks in your mind whatever you want however long however short whatever form we, we really do not want to put any guide or rules on on the on the stuff people create i think that would uh, potentially that that's like the filter that we talked about that we do not want so we want to tell as little as possible about what we want and just see what comes in and uh, basically any format works. It can be yeah. a verse, it can be a poem, it can be a picture, or it can be like some kind of uh, funny poster. Like I saw Fender, for example, created several of them and they're like uh, super laughable. So there are really no limits. I, I would say if it even would be, you know, some ASCIA art, like some kind of funny stuff made from symbols, we would still publish it as long as it is it's about bitcoin so yeah. anything works we want variety and we don't want uh like for example i i thought about that earlier as well caro when you talked about your articles the, your last articles about ninjas and the bananas which created uh, somewhat of a small drama on twitter today um and what we really do not want to do is limit or like have this dogma that Bitcoin culture is, this is Bitcoin culture and this is not Bitcoin culture. Like we want uh, the community to define the Bitcoin culture because that's how it really is. And uh, Bitcoin culture is like this guy wrote about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Bitcoin. We have uh, the Bitcoin music, we have the Bitcoin art scene, we have all kinds of philosophical input. We have just stories about particular Bitcoiners journeys in Bitcoin in different countries. We have a linking Bitcoin to old retro computers. We, we don't want to define it. We want the whole the whole spectrum of, of culture that exists in this space. And I think it's it's really rich. And if there is a few things that are typical Bitcoiner, I think those are that the Bitcoiners tend to be independent minded and they tend to be very real people. And uh, on that note, uh, I'm really amazed at how many interesting people are in this space feels like I could be friends with pretty much everyone I talk to in this space. Um, I really love being a part of it. Yeah, that's one of the things I really appreciate about the space as well, is how unfiltered the voices are and how authentic they are. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's like the honey badger maxim. Yeah. It's, it's about the lack of filter. It's about exploring possibilities. Yeah. Honey badger is so nice, too. He's such a nice guy. Until you until you try to fuck with him, then he his gloves come off and he gets real nasty. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's that's fair. I mean, yeah. that's how it is in nature, right? Hundred percent. Yeah, it's part of being real, I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to put any limits on this this recording, but you're seeing that reflected in the world right now. Everybody is so politically correct, 
and so concerned about what they say. And the very fact that you can get canceled, the whole cancel culture, the fact that you can be fired for having an opinion and stating your opinion, like that's horrible. Like, how did we get here? <laughs> it's like some weird Twilight Zone world that we live in now. Yeah, the world is insane right now. And uh, I think <laughs> Bitcoiners are part of what uh, keeps me sane, at least. Yeah, me as well. You, Alexandra, you have also, we mentioned we were thankful for everyone who had contributed and uh, you were cool enough to contribute with a piece, uh, Phoenix. Yeah. We, we really liked it. Mm. We really liked it. And uh, actually it was really cool to see like it got such a positive feedback on Twitter. Like so many people were talking about your article. I mean, that's really, really cool and uh, heartwarming to see when people uh, react like that. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was... Um... It was something that I was kind of compelled to write. And it was almost a protest against all the madness that's going on right now in the world. And to me, Bitcoin is really the solution. And I think probably about two months ago is when we heard the news of character, you know, in the middle of a protest saying, uh, trying to, he was like a voice of reason in a, a sea of madness. And, you know, he's saying, you know, all the stuff that's going on, you guys need to look into Bitcoin. And it really went viral. And... Um, I think we need more voices like that. So that's why I, I included there's a reference to character and that is uh, entirely a dedication you know, to his, uh, his act and what he was saying. And so at the very close of the article, that's uh, the reference. Uh, let's see, I think I, think I can say this because the print copy is out now. So there's a, a new um, self-banked put together uh, in the latest uh, issue of, of Citadel Volume 4, the graphic novel. Yeah. Yeah. So the graphic novel. And so at the very, the penultimate page, the very back, he asked if I would consider including Phoenix. So there is a hard copy of Phoenix included in that. Yeah. That was really cool. Uh, since you were already published in Citadel 21, I, I think they cut that page from our version of it, but it's in the, it's totally on 21 this month in their printed edition. Totally understand that. You want to make sure that each edition is unique. And I think that's part of the zine culture. So if people are looking to contribute, what's the best way that they can get their work to you? Uh, they can go to the website where we have submission form, or I guess for some people it would be easier just to catch up with us on Twitter. Uh, and I think that's how we get submissions most of the times, just people DMing us and asking about how to contribute, and uh, we take it from there. So both ways will work. And then the uh, the website, I know where it is, but... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, citadel21.com. That's uh, the website. Cool.